I'm Trevor Morris and I'm the Dean. I'm just gonna say a few quick words of welcome, but let me encourage all of you to continue um, enjoying the reception. Um, you won't all sit down for dinner until closer to 6.30. Um, but while I can be here, I just wanted to but begin by saying welcome to all of you and to thank you for joining us uh, for this very special Hoffinger Colloquium in honor of our dear friend and colleague, Jim Jacobs. The Hoffinger uh, Criminal Justice Colloquium was established through the leadership of Jack Hoffinger, former ADA for New York County, a uh, celebrated lawyer named among best lawyers in America for criminal defense and white collar criminal defense after his time in the prosecutor's office. Jack couldn't be here today, um, but I believe his daughter has joined us. There she is. Thank you very much for being here. Um, we are enormously grateful to Jack and to the entire Hoffinger family uh, for generously supporting the colloquium and specifically for making it possible for us to honor Jim here tonight. Uh, Jim Jacobs. Uh, I, none of us could possibly have enough time to do justice uh, to Jim, the colleague, the man, the scholar, the teacher. He is our Chief Justice Warren Berger Professor of Constitutional Law and the Courts, Director of the Center for Research in Crime and Justice, and convener of the Hoffinger Criminal Justice Colloquium. Jim earned his JD and PhD from Chicago in 1973 and 75, respectively. And he came to the law school first in 1981 as a visitor from Cornell and then joined our faculty permanently in 1982. You all know that he is a master teacher of criminal law and criminal procedure. From time to time, courses like federal criminal law and juvenile justice, and he also teaches at least one specialized seminar each year on topics ranging from vice crime to cyber crime, asset forfeiture and money laundering, and most recently, the Second Amendment and regulation of weapons. Jim has published 16 books and more than 100 articles. His first book, Stateville, the Penitentiary in Mass Society, is regarded as a classic and deals with the impact of gangs, public employee unionism, prisoners' rights litigation, and other developments in the post-World War II era on the social organization of American prisons. Five books, including Breaking the Devil's Pact, document the government's long-term campaign to eradicate Italian-American organized crime. Books on other criminal justice topics are Can Gun Control Work? Hate Crimes, Criminal Law and Identity Politics, The Pursuit of Absolute Integrity, Drunk Driving, an American Dilemma, and The Eternal Criminal Record, which was supported by a Guggenheim Fellowship. And this fall, NYU Press will publish Jim's newest book, The Toughest Gun Control Law in the Nation, The Unfulfilled Promise of New York's SAFE Act. Jim is the recipient of numerous awards, including being named a Guggenheim Foundation Fellow in 2012 and 13, a Fellow of the American Society of Criminology, a Fulbright Fellow at the University of Cape Town, where he spent the spring and summer of 1995, and in 2012, the International Association for the Study of Organized Crime presented Jim with a richly deserved Lifetime Achievement Award. Jim truly is the pioneer of the criminal law group here at NYU. He is a leader to which our entire community of criminal law scholars turns for mentorship. He's the backbone of our criminal law faculty and the reason so many of our colleagues came here to teach and write about criminal law at NYU. We are all incredibly lucky to count Jim as our colleague and our friend. And thank you, Jim, for everything you've done for all of us, for the law school and for the law. We are delighted to be with, here with you this evening. So there will, be, there will be more said later. For now, please uh, enjoy each other, and, and, and Rachel suggests enjoying the bar as well. And um, we'll let you know when to be seated. Thank you again. Good evening, everyone. Good evening. On behalf of myself, my colleagues David Garland and Rachel Barkow, I'd like to welcome you to this celebration of our beloved James B. Jacobs, AKA Jim. And his scholarship. You'll be happy to know it's not a comprehensive celebration because that would have been a multi-day, nay, week event. 
Uh, but we are here to celebrate Jim and his work. It's often said that the three pillars of academic life are scholarship, teaching, and service. But each of these pillars really serves one common objective, to leave one's mark. Academics strive in their scholarship to make a mark on the world of ideas, to bring their own voice to the most vexing questions of the time. They strive in their teaching to make a mark on the generations that follow them by educating and mentoring the next generation of scholars and practitioners. And they strive in their service to make a mark on the institution and the communities to which they belong. To enter those spaces and improve them, not just for their own enrichment or even the enrichment of each individual participant, but to bring to life something bigger than themselves or each part. A larger sense of community and belonging and intellectual exchange that transcends the capacity of any one member. But just as it's true that those are the much vaunted pillars of academic life, so is it true that in any single academic, you almost never find excellence in all three. We know the archetypes, the prolific scholar whose work is universally acclaimed, but who locks themselves in their office and shirks as much committee or community institutional work as possible the amazing teacher or the institutional player who volunteers and fills your inbox with invitations or uh, requests and whom students love and seek out for mentorship and opportunity, but whom as a result has all but withdrawn from scholarly pursuits. Most of us ordinary academics don't even try to achieve excellence in all three pillars. We're struggling hard enough to leave our mark in just one but not Jim Jacobs. Nope, as anyone could tell you, and as you will hear tonight, if there's any doubt remaining, Jim is the consummate academic, the perfect fulfillment of those three qualities. He's the prolific and influential scholar who churns out books as though they were parking tickets, <laughs> addressing the most consequential and important issues of the day, typically before anyone else has. He's the tireless mentor who nurtures his students' curiosity, who selflessly authors co-authorships, guidance at every turn, who's nourished into flourishment many academic careers. And of course, as we all know, he's the gracious and generous colleague, giving up countless hours of his own time to organize and convene events, not just for the NYU community, but for the New York City criminal justice community at large. With the help of Ron Goldstock, he's regularly convened our Goldstock seminars. And of course, with the support of the Hoffinger family and Jack Hoffinger, he's helped craft the single intellectual uh, gathering of criminal justice scholars in the New York City area, which is the Hoffinger Colloquium. In both and all of those places, he's created a welcome and intellectually engaging space where friendships have blossomed, articles have been created or destroyed, and a community has taken root. So now again, Jim, you bring us together, but tonight we turn the spotlight onto you. Tonight it's our great pleasure to welcome you, Jim, your family, the Hoffinger family, and all of our honored guests to celebrate your work and your achievements. All right, uh, so my task is to tell you a little bit about the booklet that was sitting on your chairs when you sat down. Um, so you'll notice inside the booklet is a program that'll kind of give you the outline of the evening's events. And I bet you are tempted to start reading what is in front of you uh, because there are many wonderful reflections of Jim in there. Um, I will tell you I got many of these entries and saw them as they came in and I pretty much put aside whatever I was doing to read them right away. Um, and they're amazing, um, but you should wait and savor this to when you have more time. Um, if you want to feel inadequate right now, you can flip to the back cover where you'll see these 16 book covers that uh, are Jim's books. Um, but you will see that, as Aaron has already alluded, that astounding productivity is all the more remarkable when you read the things that people have shared inside. Because you will see that he has managed to achieve extraordinary professional success that we could only dream of, while also being one of the finest people on the planet. 
it's filled with stories of how Jim is always reaching out to check on his friends, how he embraces all the world has to offer. He has done more in an average week in New York than I have done in 18 years here, I will say, um, and how brilliant and funny he is. Uh, so we had such an outpouring of support for this, uh, we couldn't even fit all the pictures that people submitted. Uh, so hopefully you will enjoy this slideshow throughout the evening of uh, some of the things that people shared with us. Um, now, you might think Liber Amicorum is Latin for fake news because it seems impossible that one person could produce all of this. Um, how could you produce all of this scholarship, maintain all these deep and lasting friendships, run all of our criminal law programming, which is every single week we bring in amazing guests, Jim brings in amazing guests, uh, runs the Hoffinger, and then he does everything else from being a patron of the arts to skiing the toughest slopes to being a loving father, husband, grandfather. Um, so you are truly an inspiration to all of us. And I speak for everybody here when I say we could not be happier to finally get to celebrate you at a Hoffinger uh, and talk about the amazing body of work that you have produced. Um, and it's a real honor to be part of a criminal law group with you on this faculty. And I just wanted to add a personal note here to say, uh, when I started at NYU as an entry level, um, I had no idea what I was doing uh, as a scholar, as a teacher, um, as a colleague. Uh, and I turned to Jim as my role model for all of those things. Uh, and I could not have asked for a better one. Um, and whenever times were good or times were bad, Jim was the first one to be there with a hug and a word of encouragement to get me through many, many days. Um, and as you will see, the amazing part is he has this magical ability to do that for so many people. Um, and the Liber Amicorum will show that for you and show that I am hardly alone in having an enormous debt of gratitude to Jim. Uh, but Jim's not perfect. Um, and he, and truth be told, Jan, um, did fail in one thing, which was their effort to try to make me and Tony more cultured. Uh, they tried so hard with their invitations. They even found a dance program at the Joyce Theater where the music was Springsteen. And they thought that was going to be the key for us, but uh, still too highbrow uh, for our taste. Uh, but Jim meets people where they're at, uh, even if that means the diner around the corner or <laughs> the olive tree. And for that, I'm also grateful. Um, so uh, please join me uh, in enjoying this book at your leisure. Uh, it actually means Liber Amicorum means a book of friends. Uh, and that is certainly what this book represents. Um, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to introduce who will be our next three speakers. I'm going to introduce everybody all at once. Um, and then as each person finishes, hopefully the next person doesn't mind coming right up afterwards. Um, they're going to give us a glimpse into various stages of Jim's life. So our first speaker will be Jeff Lauren, a close friend of Jim since their freshman year of college, which as Jan put it, was groovy 1965. Um, so he will give us a glimpse of Jim at Johns Hopkins. Uh, then we'll hear from Paula England, who is a sociology professor here at NYU and was a classmate of Jim's at the University of Chicago, where they were both pursuing their sociology PhDs. Um, and then third, we'll hear from Maggie Lewis, a professor of law at Seton Hall, a graduate of NYU, who's an expert in China. And and we'll talk about the connections that Jim has with China, um, much more positive than the connections that sought to be established earlier today, I will say. Um, so if Jeff doesn't mind coming up and getting us started, and then we'll hear afterwards from Paula and Maggie. And thank you again for letting us do this, Jim. We're really excited. Good evening, and as, as I was introduced, uh, I'm Jeff Lauren, and I met Jim uh, in 1965, so I'm a very dear old friend, but most of the people in the room here are very dear old friends of Jim's. We were freshmen in college at, at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore in the fall of 1965, and when we met, uh, he was a very special guide to me right from the very beginning. Um, I know we're here tonight to celebrate his career as an academic, but I'd like to go back a little bit and tell you some stories about his uh, college days and my college days with him. When I met him, I met him actually as an athlete. I don't know if you, how many of you realize this, but Jim was a... Uh, a, a serious athlete. He was a, a very good tennis player. He, uh, he liked all sports and he, 
he was he was he was a jock. He he was a gym rat. He he actually liked being in the gyms and the locker rooms, and he liked all of the sweat and the whole scene of uh, locker rooms. And not only was he uh, a good tennis uh, player, but on the indoor courts he was a ferocious racquetball player, and then eventually became a very canny squash player. Uh, he, he, he loved playing basketball. He was a great basketball player when he was a kid and he still wanted to play. And any pickup game in the gym, he would gladly join. He uh, was a very good swimmer, excellent swimmer. He loved all water sports and boating and canoeing and rowing. Uh, he, 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 he was a fan of sports as well. He used to follow all the professional sports and college sports. and. Uh, you know, I don't think people know that about him, but he, he really was a, uh, an, an athlete at heart. Uh, later, I guess in his early 30s, he, he took up running uh, as, for exercise. And of course, Jim being Jim, he decided he was going to train for and run a marathon. And he, uh, he picked one of the harder marathons with the hilly course, and he finished in a really good time. So he, he, he was pretty amazing. Uh, but I guess what I want to say that from all that I know of him and admire of Jim, what impressed me in, in college, not just his athletic abilities, was, was his, his demeanor, his, his mind, his reasoning, his, his writing skills. And that came out when we were 18-year-old kids from right out of high school. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a short story about how I, I, I learned about his, his skills. Uh, one time, I think one of the first times I met Jim, early in the, the fall of our inaugural semester at, at Hopkins in 65, uh, I, I, I went over to his dorm room. And uh, it turns out, just by chance, his uh, roommate was a good friend of mine from high school. So I knew him pretty well. And uh, so one evening, I, early in the evening, I started to take a break from studying. And I walked across the freshman quadrangle to their house, to their dorm room. And uh, I went to see my friend. And I had really only met Jim once or twice, just in passing. And as I walked in the room, my friend and I just sitting around on his couch or his bed just to, to BS, just to relax. And Jim was sitting there at his desk, banging away on his old portable electric typewriter. I don't know if you remember electric typewriters. And he had an old, I think it was like an old lime green uh, Olivetti. And he was just intense, concentrating hard on, on this, this essay that he was writing for a, a, a short essay for an assignment in class. And as my friend and I were talking, Jim and he'd join in a little bit, but most of the time he was working away. And uh, finally, when he finished, I just said to the top of my head, I said, well, can I take a look at it? Can I, take, uh, can I see it? And he sheepishly handed it over to me. And I was just shocked. I was amazed. I was expecting a, a rough copy, a first draft. And here he, he presented to me a perfectly typed paper. It was just brilliantly written. Just uh, in, in the, the, the syntax, the, the, everything about it, the, the, the clarity of his, of his thoughts. Uh, I was just, just floored. And I thought to myself then, well, this is, this is a special guy. I could just knock this out while he, people are talking around him. And, I, I, was, I was pretty impressed, and I said, I'm going to have to follow this guy. And it turns out that uh, our last two years of college, we were roommates in off-campus housing, so I got to see his, his study habits and, and, and how he thought through things. Uh, so it was not too surprising to me that uh, upon graduation, he graduated Phi Beta Kappa, and of course, he, he was able to uh, obtain two very prestigious fellowships. One was a uh, was a Watson Fellowship, which allowed Watson, named after the founder of IBM, uh, it allowed him to travel uh, around the world, pay for a year's worth of travel, and he spent most of it driving by himself, driving through Eastern Europe and Russia in 1970. I mean, it was not an easy thing to drive through, uh, and he pulled that off. And the the, the second. Uh, the second fellowship was a, a full ride, all the tuition paid to the three years at the University of Chicago Law School. And as they say, the rest was history. Hi, I'm Paula England, a sociologist here at NYU. And um, 
Jim and I met when we were grad students in sociology. So many of you think of him as, you know, having a law degree and a law professor, which of course he is and was. Um, but he was like simultaneous, I guess he started in law, but somehow he ended up, I don't quite know the sequencing, but at some point he was like simultaneously taking, you know, maybe a full curriculum, I don't know, in law and in sociology. So I was pretty intimidated by that. Um, anyhow, we became buddies in a stats class. Now, if truth be told, I think I was a little better at stats than Jim was. <laughs> but he contributed, so we did our homework together, and this was in the days when um, there were hand calculators, but the ones that could do a square root cost too much. Like, I couldn't afford it. And Jim had a little more money than me, I think, but um, I, he didn't have one either. So we would go, do you remember this, Jim? We would go in the ed school where they had these old Frieden calculators. The story's gonna come back to you. And so if the thing involved a square root, you'd put these numbers in and then you literally crank it like this, and then you'd hear this like chuka 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 chuka, and then the answer comes out. So we would do our homework in this way. And, um, you know, what I actually, so okay, maybe I was a little better at stats than Jim, but he contributed something to me too, which was, bravado. Um, so, you know, I would say something like, oh God, you know, it's like two days before the test and, uh, you know, we're doing this problem and it's, not, you know, there's two numbers here, but it's not obvious which number we put where in the formula. And he would say, look, it's got to be these two numbers in the, in the thing because they're the only two numbers they gave us. And so let's just do it and get on with it. And I think there was kind of a lesson in there, like, you don't have to be perfect and just do the best you can and get done and, you know, move on. Um, so that was a contribution. Um, and um, so we also had lunches across the midway. I don't know, at Newark or there's law school or something. Anyhow, there was some place we would have lunch. And I always brought my lunch um, because I had very little money. And Jim would treat me to a Coke. This was, this was a very big deal. I really like Cokes, I guess. Um, so, okay, fast forward. We lost touch mostly for decades. We would see each other, you know, once every 10 or 15 years or something. Once I came and stayed with Jan um, in their apartment when Jim was out of town or something, when I, I think maybe ASA was in. Um, but what I do remember about this period is that, um, you know, Jim, I was trying to make my way as a, fledgling gender scholar. Um, and I began my career at University of Texas at Dallas, a pretty obscure place, and I was there for a long time. And at one point during this, um, I talked to Jim, or got together or something, and he said, you know, this topic you're doing, this is a really hot topic. And um, his advice to me was, you should have no unpublished thoughts. <laughs> and, <laughs> and to kind of, <laughs> And to kind of emphasize that, he said, you know, like, your grocery list could be, you know, feminist history or something here. <laughs> so, you know, uh, I think people have talked about, I mean, we all come here tonight because Jim's a great scholar, and that's well known. And of course, in those days, I didn't know that that was going to happen. Um, but... When I look back on it, I can see that I always saw Jim as this like force of nature, you know, that like, I don't know, whatever he does, it's gonna like have momentum. Um, and I see now that he was a force of nature that became an incredible scholar. Um, but if I could personalize it a little bit, Part of what Jim meant to me, and people have talked about some of his personal qualities, is he um, contributed to my sense of self-confidence that I could be a scholar. Uh, and for that, I'm really grateful, Jim. Thank you. And thank you for your career.
So I'm Maggie Lewis, and I'm here to talk about China and Jim, which you might not know much about because most of you don't know him from his travels. But first, I must thank you for my job. <laughs> I do. We were on a sailboat, one of those fantastic cruises, and you came up to me, Maggie. I almost perjured myself. Seton Hall called for your reference check, and I went up to the line. I almost perjured myself. I've been there a decade. I think you're safe. They seem to like me. But thank you. I really appreciate that. So, uh, but I had the joy of getting to know Jim, not just here, but through our travels, both with NYU's U.S. Asia Law Institute and also with the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and the Rule of Law Dialogue. And when we went to China, Jim brought not only his encyclopedic knowledge, of course, of U.S. law, but he brought curiosity and humility and rigor to sometimes what were very difficult discussions. And he was candid and unflinching, describing our criminal justice system, and he asked perceptive questions of all those at the table. And he always wanted to learn. Of course, you wanted to learn about criminal justice in China, but you wanted to learn about everything else. And you kept going back to China, even when you had plenty to keep you busy here. And we are grateful that you kept going back. One time we were there and you decided you needed to learn some Chinese, okay? Um, it's not an easy language, Chinese. It's tonal. Um, but I said, okay, at the breakfast table, let's teach Jim Jacobs Chinese. So I taught him three words, you might remember. The first one, and they all were, they rhymed and they had the same tone. So it was zao, which is morning, but is a greeting in the morning. Hao, which is good, all purpose and bao, which means to be stuffed or filled. So Jim went out with zao, hao, bao, and he rocked it. That was it. He was good. He was totally good. So we were there. And um, uh, when, I, when I knew I was going to speak about China, I reached out to other people who had been to China with Jim. And Daniel uh, Yuping uh, mentioned that when they had gone to China with an NYU group, that he got lots of laughs when he said that his career was filled with criminals. The, the Chinese thought that was great. Actually, I, Rachel, maybe we're getting a lot more criminals in both governments nowadays, but um, yes. And, um, and then we also asked Barbara Fredericks, who is retired from the Commerce Department, and she said that they had gone into a buffet and the vegetables were swimming in vats of oil. And Jim looked at it and said, Great, lots of vegetables. Maybe I'll lose weight. Um, I don't know if that happened, but you always had a good sense of humor. So for all of the Chinese scholars and practitioners you touched, and, and they should be here, not the white girl who just goes to China, but I am delighted that Wang Xiumei is here from Beijing, and she brought with her one of Jim's books that's been translated by Xiumei into Chinese. This is the uh, Hate Crimes, Criminal Law, and Identity Politics. And she assures me that more translations are in the works so that you will have an even greater influence beyond just the people who got to meet you in person. There is a Chinese phrase, Tao Li Man Tian Xia, which literally means to have peaches and plums everywhere under heaven. But what it figuratively refers to is a teacher who is so great that they have their pupils everywhere. And Jim, you are truly a teacher who spans continents. And on behalf of all of us students, xie xie. Friends of Jim Jacobs. Yeah, that, that got everyone's attention. So um, my name is David Garland. and. Like all of you, I'm a friend of Jim's. I'm also his next door neighbor in the corridor upstairs. Um, I'm going to introduce the next part of the program, the kind of main course of the evening where we, a series of speakers, will discuss Jim's work um, in some detail. So if, if you were listening when the Dean spoke earlier, I think Aaron repeated this, um, Jim is the author of 16 books. If you look at the back of your program, uh, or rather the back of the Liber Amicorum, you'll see 16 of these aligned and presented, the covers of each. Um, there's a little dispute. Some people think there are 17 books, <laughs> particularly Cyril Finot, who edited it with Jim. <laughs> but since we weren't including edited books, just the ones that Jim produced, as it were, all by himself, or other than a proceedings or an edited volume, this is the, uh, the collection we'll discuss. Now, in order to discuss 
Jim's publications, and of course there's a hundred articles in addition to the books, we invited not one, not two, but seven speakers. Now, don't worry, they're all on a very tight leash, although not all of them are actually responsive to leashes, I believe. But, so, but shockingly enough, Seven speakers aren't enough experts to cover the full range of Jim's work. We, we obviously had to have a speaker on organized crime, on prisons, on criminal records, on gun control. These are the areas for which Jim is world-renowned. But remarkably, there are about a half a dozen other specialisms, civil-military relations, corruption control, drink driving, drug legalization, hate crimes and identity politics, for which Jim is also a leading authority in the field and which he's written crucial books, significant books, books that we want to discuss this evening. So, um, Isaiah Berlin famously said that there are two kinds of writers. There are foxes who know many things and that there are hedgehogs who know one big thing. Now, I never thought I'd hear myself say this, but Jim's a fox. <laughs> Sorry, Jan. Um, <laughs> by, by that I mean he certainly doesn't believe in one big thing. Jim's work, as you know, is painstakingly empirical, and he has a hard-headed realism that he brings to it. He abjures all forms of dogma, and he stays clear. I think he's allergic to grand theory. The result is that Jim's work is always interestingly at odds with the conventional wisdom. And that's what I love best about Jim as an intellectual. He's beholden to no one. There's no party line. There's no big theory. There's no ideological purity. His attention is trained on the real world on facts and institutions, and particularly on what criminal justice actors are actually thinking and doing. Now, Jim, of course, does have some working propositions. Basically, you know, what is it they say? You should keep an open mind, but not so open that your brains fall out. <laughs> so so he, has, he has some a priori. They, they might include, for example, that not all problems are soluble, that more government is probably not the solution, that problems like crime and corruption are endemic and have to be regulated, but that zealous regulation is liable to produce its own problems. That the role of organized crime in this nation's formation and history has never been properly recognized and acknowledged, and that gun control is never going to happen. <laughs> so he thought drug legalization wasn't going to happen either, so I'm holding out some hope that he's wrong about that. But but anyway, so quantity and range are two of the virtues of Jim's work. But actually, his work is also remarkable for its enduring quality and significance. Stateville, published in 1977 and still in print, is on any definition a scholarly classic. But I would predict that in decades to come, people will look at his 2015 book, Harvard University Press, The Eternal Criminal Record, and regard that as a landmark of the same order. So, two classics, nearly 40 years apart, and about a dozen great books in between. I don't think there's any scholar that I can think of who's got that kind of record. It really just is astonishing. So, and here I'm revealing my inner hedgehog, <laughs> let me try and say something general about this enormous collected works of James B. Jacobs. I want to say something about its origins, its genres, and in particular about its signature intellectual style. So Jim's early works, sounding like Karl Marx, the early works, before, <laughs> before the epistemological break and the later works. So not, not Karl Marx, Jim. Uh, Max Weber, how about that? Um, <laughs> so Jim's early works bear the stamp of his training at Hopkins in Chicago and in particular, the mark of the world-class mentors that he found in these places. Without Norval Morris, for
for example, the, the then dean of the Chicago Law School, without Norval Morris, there would be no Stateville. Not because of Norval's ideas, I would say that the intellectual stamp of uh, Edward Schills is actually more important than that book, but because Norval was the person that assigned Jim to go and do research in the Illinois prisons. And also the person, I think, that, that persuaded Jim that pragmatism and realism were part of any pursuit of an ideal, and that that was the way to think about these things. Similarly, without Morris Janovich, the great sociologist, there would be no two books by Jim on civil-military relations, on socio-legal aspects of the military. Now, I guess Jeff was talking before about the forgotten history of Jim the athlete. There was also the forgotten history of Jim the soldier, right? There was, there was, there was a military period in the, the, the James B. Jacobs history, and my guess is that there were some insights and some emotional connections there that Janowitz helped you to work up into a sociological understanding, but you probably brought to it your own experience. So Jim went on to become a leading authority in both these areas. But I think his most distinctive writing and his characteristic intellectual voice is not apparent in these books, not even apparent in the books on organized crime. For my own taste, I think that Jim's signature style is most fully on display in the books that I would describe as being about the ironies of American policy. To explain what I mean, let me distinguish three genres in the Jacobs oeuvre. First genre, the work on prisons and imprisonment. The leading works here, of course, are Stateville, Guard Unions and the Future of the Prison, and Perspectives on Prisons and Imprisonment, as well as dozens of articles, some of which, for example, Sentencing by Prison Personnel in the UCLA Law Review, are really just classic tour de force, that, that basically that article dealt with a really crucial subject, resentencing by guards, good time remission and so on. Um, no one had written that up before. No one had thought this is an important topic, this is a major issue. Jim identified it, pursued it, looked at the 50 states and the federal government and the practices, all of which of course are crazy and uneven and different, and presented an article that's a jurisprudence of this. It's just astonishing. These prison publications, this genre is notable First of all, for their insider's view and for their up-close understanding. But most importantly, and this is what's enduring about Stateville in particular, because it brings a sociological perspective to bear. It basically looks at, this was the 1960s and 70s, looks at the major changes going on in American society and the ways that they, in surprising and unexpected and perverse ways, impacted the inner lives of prisons. And that, the, the, the kind of macro sociology of the inner life of prisons, no one else has done that. And that remains a kind of classic study of its kind. Second genre, the work on organized crime and racketeering. This section of the collected works consists of five books, or six if we count the one with Cyril. <laughs> and this forms, I think, a remarkable series, probably the most sustained effort by any single scholar to address the, the profound question of organized crime and racketeering. These books, I think surprisingly, actually tell quite positive stories. They describe prosecutions that work, industries that have been cleaned up, labor unions that have been purged of corruption. And if I remind you of some of the titles, again, they're on the back of your Liber Amicorum, you'll see what I mean. So, Breaking the Devil's Pact, Gotham Unbound, Busting the Mob, Organized crime and its containment. So on Jim's analysis, the last episode of The Sopranos ought to have been a RICO indictment, right? <laughs> Basically, that's, that's an insider joke. But um, The third genre, the one that I want to focus on, the one that I think in a way expresses Jim best, and I interrupt myself to remind you that there's an earring here that someone, <laughs> some, someone lost earlier, if you want to reclaim it, either during or after my speech, that would be fine. <laughs> the third genre I call the ironies of American social policy. So if the study of organized crime finds Jim in an optimistic mood, this third genre is much more sardonic in tone. I think of these books as a kind of Jacobian study in skepticism. Each of these books takes a policy reform, typically one that's been embraced by the uh, 
the liberal elites and also by the legal academy, which pretty much the same thing as far as Jim's concerned. <laughs> and Jim sh proceeds to then show how, in very concrete ways, the reform backfires. So books in this group would, would include Can Gun Control Work? Answer, probably not. The Pursuit of Absolute Integrity, in which corruption control is shown to create more problems than it solves. And the book on hate crimes, wherein he argues that hate crimes mostly a means whereby identity politics messes up the criminal law, essentially. And there are several articles in the same formula that kind of douse liberal ideas with cold water. Should hate, crime, should hate be a crime? I like this one. Can we ever clean up the Javits Center? <laughs> you decide. Will New York's SAFE Act make us safer? And you just know what the answer of these <laughs> titles is going to be, right? But perhaps my favorite is an essay on drink driving, another one of Jim's classic topics, that he wrote for the New York Review of Books way back in 1983 under the wonderful one-word topic. Can you remember what it was? Smashed. In Smashed, Jim argues that the then current efforts to criminalize and to punish drunk drivers would be less effective and more harmful than a preventative policy that focused on requiring manufacturers to install passive restraints, such as automatic seatbelts, airbags. And of course, in the 35 years since then, John has be, uh, Jim has been repeatedly shown to be correct. And in case you thought that scrapping sensible regulations was a practice that had begun with our current president, Jim points out, and I think against type, that President Reagan's administration, which was leading the effort to criminalize drunk drivers, was at the same time rescinding legal regulations that required manufacturers to fit safety measures. Now, fortunately, Reagan lost that battle, and even in Republican-American, sometimes good sense prevails, But there's my thesis, right? What Jim is best known for his books on the prison, the mafia, criminal records, but his studies and skepticism are the ones that best express his distinctive authorial voice and his personal worldview. But this is just a hedgehog theory. In truth, Jim's remarkable body of work defies easy summary, which is why we've lined up a real cast of experts to discuss each of these books or these, each of these four main topics one by one. Let me end by introducing the speakers. Each of them is very famous. You can look at the back of the program, this being the age of Google, you can look them up yourself. I'm not gonna say much about them. I'm gonna tell you their names, then one line about each. First of all, these are, these are paired. Ron Goldstock and Cyril Finot will come up and talk about Jim's work on organized crime and racketeering. Michael Jacobson and Dirk Vanzel Smith will talk about Jim on prisons and imprisonment. Jeremy Travis and Elena, Elena Larrauri will talk about his work on criminal records. And Frank Zimring will discuss Jim's work on guns and gun control, including the new book that comes out, I guess, in November, NYU Press, entitled The Toughest Gun Control Law in the Nation, about the New York Safe Act. So, each of these speakers is a famous academic, take it from me. <laughs> or, or you can be the judge of that. <laughs> They have all sorts of awards and distinctions, but for this evening's purposes, the only thing that matters is the following. First, Ron Goldstock met Jim at Cornell and introduced him to organized crime. <laughs> Cyril Finot is a close friend and, as you now know, a co-editor and a co-author. Michael Jacobson and Jim have been friends since the early 1980s when they both served on New York City's Criminal Justice Agency. Dirk Vanzel Smit, and you can see the photographs to prove it, was Jim's host in South Africa when Jim was there as a Fulbright scholar. Jeremy Travis was the first research fellow here at Jim's Center for Research in Crime and Justice, also helped set up the Fortinoffs and the Hoffingers as they became. Elena, La Elena Larauri was the, uh, from Spain as a friend of Jim's and also a co-author on criminal records. And finally, Frank Zimring. Frank has many claims to fame. But his chief one this evening 
is that in the academic year 1970, 1971, at University of Chicago Law School, he taught Jim criminal law as a 1L. <laughs> as Jeff Lawrence said, the rest is history. Thank you. <laughs> the earring. So you heard everything I had to say from David. Um, let me say uh, two things before I begin. Um, one is um, I am on the board of the Javits Center. <laughs> and the answer to the question is yes, it can be cleaned up. Uh, the other is that you will uh, later hear from Jeremy Travis. He will come up here with a stain on his shirt. He will suggest that it was I who knocked off with a glass of wine onto him. I think he's just clumsy. <laughs> so I've been asked to speak about Jim's work in organized crime scholarship within the United States, and Cyril, who is a good friend of both of ours, is going to discuss it as it pertains internationally. Prior to Jim's entry into the field, there was a paucity of scholarship about organized crime within the United States. With the exception of Landesco and Cressy on the sociological front and Shelley and Reuter on the economic side, what you, much of what passed for scholarship were a series of books and articles generally seeking to define organized crime, what it was or what it was supposed to be, but more likely by individuals who made arguments against the existence of the mob. To be sure, there were Charles Roggevin, uh, but he did mostly governmental commission work, and of course, G. Robert Blakey, um, who was the author of much legislation dealing with organized crime, um, and his scholarship tended to be, after he wrote the legislation, writing a series of law review articles trying to explain it to people who didn't understand it. <laughs> Let's go back to 1928. That time, John Landesco, who had received his PhD in sociology a few years earlier from the University of Chicago, wrote, quote, one reason for the failure of crusades against organized crime is they are seldom or never based on a study of the problem. What is needed is a program that deal, will deal with the crime problem in detail and consecutively. That is, by analyzing the crime situation into its different elements and one by one working out a constructive solution. Despite this plea, and its good sense, enforcement practices remain largely independent of analysis for another 50 years. What did occur 50 years later is there was a guy by the name of Jim Jacobs who got a PhD in sociology from that same University of Chicago Law School, uh, University of Chicago. Perhaps it was karma flowing from Chicago School of Sociology that connected Landesco and Jacobs. Um, but I'm going to take the credit. Um, <laughs> why not? Um, in the early 1980s, I, as director of the New York State Organized Crime Task Force, asked Jim to do just what Landesco had sought. Governor Mario Cuomo had requested us to study the scandalous construction industry and propose solutions to what even the governor acknowledged was largely an insoluble problem. Despite not having studied mob activity prior to the acceptance of my invitation, Jim became the principal drafter of our response to the governor. His inquisitive mind seeking out historical, economic, legal, and criminological perspectives. The final report to the governor was issued by the task force, but more importantly, was published word for word by NYU Press, which described the report as transcending the governmental to the academic. It is widely seen now as the basis on which the construction industry was freed from mob control. But that was to be only the first of Jim's intellectual forays into the question of how and why the mob made its way 
not only into the construction industry, but numerous other in major in uh, industries and institutions. In Gotham Unbound, he grappled with, among other things, the fish market, the garment district, the carding industry, the Javits Center, and with vivid descriptions of their unique problems, that is, one by one taking the crime problem and then thinking of a solution, and then writing the solutions that seemed most reasonable to him. If there is an afterlife, I have little doubt that Landesco would be devouring Jim's works and beaming with pride. The OCTF report dealt not only with labor corruption, but with official corruption as well. For example, building inspectors were subject of some of the work that we did. Building inspectors had over 100 years bribed or extorted pay, been bribed or extorted payments based on their ability to cause delay in construction, which costs enormous amounts of money. And they could do so because building codes were so Byzantine and so complex that no one understood them, and they only became more complex and more Byzantine because every time there was a problem, something else was added to the code. The attempt to contain all waste, abuse, and fraud extended beyond those codes to the internal operations of government itself. And David made uh, reference to this. The result was often ironically more corrupt behavior and limitations on innovation and risk taking while stymieing the legitimate purposes of government and stopping the production of goods and services. This pursuit of absolute integrity became the subject of another of Jim's books, one, this one he wrote with Frank Anacarico, and one which was closely studied by people in government, particularly those charged with creating ethical rules for civil servants. Busting the mob, the United States versus Cosa Nostra went beyond New York with analysis of law enforcement victories both in the areas of prosecution and non-traditional remedies, including those used in Teamsters Local 560 in New Jersey and the International Teamsters Union. Norville Morris rightly observed that at long last, scholarship as opposed to sensationalism comes to the analysis of organized crime. Those chapters would then be expanded into the definitive study of the mob and the Teamsters breaking the Devil's Pact. Jim's interest in the labor movement was not in, limited to the Teamsters. In mobsters, unions, and feds, he explored the use of civil RICO in locals and internationals, providing what Clyde Summers, the legendary champion of union democracy, called, quote, a near encyclopedic account of the mafia's infiltration, control, and exploitation of major labor organizations. And of course, there are the articles, there are the formal lectures, there are the informal talks, the interviews, the quotations that pepper the world of organized crime scholarship and criminology. Today, the world of academic literature relating to syndicated crime and official and labor corruption is far richer and the mob is far poorer than the day then Jim first took his steps up to the uh, front door of the organized crime task force. And while my instructions were quite clear that this presentation was to be an academic, not personal tribute to Jim, I feel quite comfortable in noting that had things been different, had our personal relationship not begun at Cornell, where incidentally my daughters were his flower girls at Jim and Jan's wedding, had he not moved to NYU and I had not taken over the organized crime task force, not only might the richness of academic literature that I described not come about, but the richness in my life that comes from having Jim as a colleague, working and teaching with him, and as a friend daily being inspired by him would be sorely missing. So this is uh, still fine out, uh, if you know, as has been explained by David uh, and to others. As Ronald Goldstock already indicated, it is up to me to discuss the international resonance of Jim's research on organized crime. It goes without saying, as a good friend of Jim and Jen, 
that it really felt that I really felt honored when I got the invitation to discuss his contributions in this area. But I don't want to conceal from you that it was a bit of a poison gift too, to outline the huge impact of the, his research in maximum five minutes. <laughs> Nevertheless, I promised David Garland that I would do my best. <laughs> Let me start by confessing that the report on corruption and racketeering in the New York City construction industry that Ronald Goldstock just mentioned and that to a large extent had been drafted by Jim was for me really a flash of lightning in the darkness of the then existing academic literature on organized crime. It not only contained an in-depth analysis of the ways in which organized crime was embedded in this industry, but on the basis of this analysis, it also outlined the policy that had to be pursued in order to liberate this important economic sector from the grip of organized criminals. When I had read this impressive report, I took immediately contact with Jim and his cordial invitation to come over to New York and to visit the task force has been the beginning of a warm friendship from, that for the first time crystallized in our common effort to organize in 1990 a transatlantic conference in The Hague in order to inform the Dutch authorities about the unique efforts of the task force to take back control of a number of legitimate markets in New York. This conference, and in particular the book we edited a, a year later, has been highly influential in the Netherlands. It immediately caused a radical change in the policy with regard to the, organized, with, with regard to the containment of organized crime. Up to that moment, the dominant idea was that organized crime can only be controlled by the criminal justice system. But the project of the task force clearly demonstrated that administrative authorities equally can and must play their role. For example, by screening the applications for licenses in vulnerable markets. And after such a two-sided strategy, had been applied with some success in Amsterdam to come to grips with highly organized crime problems in the red light district, the Dutch government really became the advocate of this strategy in the European Union. It was not easy to convince the other member states that it was necessary to modernize the anti-organized crime policy in Europe. But in the end, the efforts have been quite fruitful. Nowadays in Belgium, as well as in Germany, to give just these examples, this strategy is more and more applied to deal with serious and organized crime problems in the big cities. The international resonance of Jim's research on organized crime, however, on organized crime problems, however, is definitely not limited to policy making in the Netherlands and the European Union. It has had a huge impact on academic research with regard to organized crime all over the world. This can easily be deduced from the many references to his books and articles in the related literature. From the chapters he wrote in an impressive number of leading handbooks and from his more informal contributions to many national and international conferences. Why could his writings make such an impression on the international research community? This has not only been the result of, this, of that single booklet on organized crime in the New York construction industry, that indeed, like Ron Goldstock said in the wake of the breathtaking description of organized crime in Chicago by John Landesco and the organizational analysis of Cosa Nostra by Donald Cressy, fundamentally changed the dominant, rather soulless discourse on organized crime problems in today's, in today's urban societies. It equally has been the result of the fact that Jim is the only researcher in the world who in a unique, in a unique series of impressive books documented the many faces of the organized crime phenomenon 
in the most well-known metropolis of the world and in the United States as a whole. By doing so, Jim, by doing so, Jim over the years really has built an academic lighthouse in his favorite field of research. And to prevent any misunderstanding, I finally want to underline that Jim is the opposite of a single issue researcher. <laughs> his formidable international reputation equally is based on his amazing books on such diverging subjects as gun control, hate crime, integrity and in public institutions, and last but not least, the eternal consequences of criminal records. It is therefore not an accident that only a few weeks ago, at the annual meeting of the European Society of Criminology in Ghent, a new working group was established to study the collateral consequences of these records. Thank you for your attention. I'm Michael Jacobson, and uh, along with Dirk, I've been asked to comment on Jim's scholarly work on prisons. And I'll do that, of course, but first want you to understand the overwhelming obstacles to doing that here today. The first, and most obvious, and has been mentioned before, due to an arbitrary, capricious, and outrageous decision made by some anonymous law school academic, I have a strict and inflexible an apparently unmovable 10-minute time limit. <laughs> the second, and although Jim uh, was kind enough to send me his annotated bibliography of his books, collections, edited volumes, and articles on prisons and correctional policy, it was hugely helpful, it was a nice favor, and it was a time saver. But my immediate reaction upon opening that email was, oh dear God, <laughs> how did this guy ever have time to have children? <laughs> <clears throat> you see then the difficult position I find myself in. Too much material and too little time. So my plan is as follows. I'm gonna give you a sense, or try to give you a sense of the breadth and import of his work and I'm gonna spend my remaining few minutes on his seminal work, Stateville, both in terms of what made it so unique and a classic sociological analysis of yet another peculiar institution and why I believe it has never been more relevant than it is today. So a look at the body of his work on prisons reveals an incredibly thorough and wide-ranging grasp and analysis of American penology. His articles alone deal with gangs in prison, and his articles on street gangs behind bars is in itself a hugely important piece of scholarship on this subject. The role of race and correction officer attitudes and performance, the formal and informal organization and management of prison, the impact of the prisoner rights movement generally, and the role of prison litigation and judicial oversight specifically on prison conditions, prison leadership, the evolving role and impact of public sector unions on prison staffing and operations, and even on the methodology of conducting participant observations in prisons. <clears throat> His work on the impact of federal consent decrees designed to improve conditions of confinement in which he details both their usefulness but also their significant limitations and the bureaucratic and organizational strategies that are often employed by staff to limit their effectiveness is a wonderful illustration of the clash, the clash of formal legal authority and informal organizational imperatives. When you look at his collected works, it is impossible not to be impressed by his combination of intimate knowledge, precise and sharp analysis, and the clarity of his writing. It's no accident, as David has said, that two of his mentors were Norval Morris and Morris Janowitz. I've spent a fair amount of my life working in, literally in, this area, 
and Jim's work on so many aspects of the development and changing nature of American prisons is so spot on, even 40 years later. In this vein, I'd like to spend my last few minutes on what many might consider his major work in this area, Stateville, the Penitentiary and Mass Society. I first read this when it was almost a new book from my oral exam in the early 80s. I appreciated it then, I think, but honestly, it probably got lost in the fog of orals cramming. Wait, was that Jim Jacobs, Michael Tonry, or Hans von Hedding? Who can remember? <clears throat> I initially planned on a quick read, but as I began to read it again, I started to read it more carefully and slowly and more intently. Lynn, Chancer, asked me at least a few times over the last couple of months, are you memorizing that thing? <clears throat> Yeah, kind of, and here's why. It is a masterwork in the historical, sociological, and political analysis of this institution. It is important to remember here that this book was written four and a half decades ago, and it was prescient both about the changes to come in American corrections and foreshadowed the huge scholarly interest and critiques of mass incarceration and conditions of confinement. More specifically, the book examines the effect of internal prison dynamics, such as leadership style, state level political and organizational and bureaucratic patterns, and external factors, such as the prisoners' rights movement, the growing number of minority prisoners, increasing diversity and unionization of correction officers, and how all of these, together and separately, affect and influence the operations and conditions of prison. It is so richly researched with nuance and detail that to appreciate it fully, it deserves concentrated attention. Especially for me, and my own sort of practical background, and as someone who has spent a fair amount of time inside these institutions, his analysis is razor sharp and insightful and can only come from a real and deep understanding of how these places work. <clears throat> the challenge of getting that level of understanding from these hugely complex, paramilitary, hierarchical organizations with such a significant and embedded suspicion of outsiders generally, not to mention annoying, nosy researchers specifically, is simply remarkable, and there is no other researcher, certainly in the United States, who has been able to come close to what Jim has done there. One gets a sense of how deep Jim got into this research, not just through reading the book as a whole, but from some of the small vignettes he includes throughout the book. In a casual aside, he will note, for instance, that the daily leadership staff meetings were so unfocused he was inevitably asked his opinion on most issues. <laughs> and it takes a minute before you realize, wait, you were at the daily staff meetings? <laughs> his access was simply remarkable. The book also completely brings sociological theory alive. Jim's ability to, makes Max Weber's, ability to, make, to make Max Weber's theory of bureaucracy concrete and specific through his precise descriptions and illustrations of the prison's transformation from a patriarchal organization and based on traditional authority to a rational legal bureaucracy isn't just classical theory 101. It brings Weber to life. It is a tour de force. At one point in the book, when he's talking about the emergence and impact of a very progressive leadership team, his critique is withering and filled with insight. He writes, the reform regimes failed to establish a viable equilibrium. Inmate expectations increased far more rapidly than did the material benefits or the amelioration of unsatisfactory living conditions. The reformers stressed a philosophical interpretation of the moral implications of imprisonment at the same time that the concrete physical conditions were rapidly deteriorating. The reform regime presided over a shrinking number of programmatic opportunities, but at the same time, 
encouraged inmate expectations. Jim's insight into the essential role that effective management must play in order to actually achieve progressive goals is as important and relevant today as it was four decades ago. And just a quick note on relevance. This city is in the midst, as you all know here, of a major policy debate about closing Rikers Island and the categorical imperative of changing the culture and operating principles of the Department of Corrections. It is, as Jim certainly knows, one thing to say that. It is quite another to understand what it means in practice and how, based on the best scholarship <clears throat> in the field, to think about and create the path forward. Stateful is that best scholarship, and anyone who is involved or interested in the effort to close Rikers should sit down and read it. On a personal note, when I started to read Jim's work again a few months ago in preparation for this, I approached it as an intellectual task. Much like many academics would start a broad review essay around a body of work. It pretty quickly became more than that though. It became a pleasure. And because of my own experience and academic interests, also more meaningful than I would have initially imagined. And finally, I just can't shake that image of a big conference table in the warden's office at Stateville with a bunch of uniformed and executive correction leaders and a lonely, doubtless conspicuous University of Chicago young baby scholar being sharply addressed by the warden. So Jacobs, what do you think? Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, Michael has spoken powerfully about Stateville and Jim's impact on prison studies in the United States. But what did Jim's work on prisons contribute outside the United States? Now, as you may have heard or can tell by my accent, I am a South African by birth. And Jim's pioneering research played an enormous part in our thinking there. The insight that we gleaned from what Jim wrote was that by the 1980s, even in repressive states such as South Africa, prisons were highly bureaucratized and therefore potentially at least penetrable by legal norms. Until Jim came, uh, uh, came along, sociologists of imprisonment had paid little attention to the interaction between prison law and the burgeoning prison bureaucracy. That changed with Jim's longitudinal study of stateful prison. His study showed that the intrusion of both substantive legal standards and due process into the administration um, of that particular prison had long been resisted by prison staff as it presented a threat to their traditional authority. Gradually, however, the impact of, the impact of law imposed from the outside became much more significant not only because of the specific prisoners' rights that were recognized, but also because the threat of legal action changed the way in which the prison was administrated. The result was a proliferation of and much stricter adherence to bureaucratic procedures within the prison in order to enable the authorities to, to meet the demands placed on them by the law. Now, this finding of Jim's could be generalized to other prison systems in order to introduce outside legal norms into the administration of prisons. That is certainly what we set out to do in South Africa. Guided by Jim's fundamental insights, we were able to critique the old apartheid prisons where, as in the United States, prisons uh, were white-run places housing black prisoners. And they had initially followed the same traditional authoritarian patterns. Moreover, in the new South Africa, we used his insights on prison bureaucracy to begin to create new rights-based prison laws. But that's South Africa. Jim's thinking had a valuable um, impact in Europe also. Much has been made of his uh, post-state 
uh, work there on prison guards and how they react to the legal recognition of prisoners' rights. The paradox highlighted by Jim is that while the legal assertion of prisoners' rights may impact positively on prison conditions, it may also serve to undermine the authority of prison guards. This could lead to the guards feeling threatened and becoming hostile to the newly asserted formal goals of the systems. Two quick examples within my five minutes of how this insight has been applied. When the famous Wolf Commission introduced due process-based process reforms into the English prison system in the 1990s, their effects were not what had been expected because prison officers misunderstood them, sometimes deliberately, interpreting them to mean the discipline did not have to be enforced at all. In her book, Prisons and Their Moral Performance, Alison Liebling relies on Jim's work to explain that prison officers reacted in this way because they felt a threat to their authority. My second example is a bit more obscure, but at the same time, it's a wonderful illustration of how wide and lasting Jim's impact has been. This year, three young Romanian criminologists published an absolutely fascinating empirical study um, in the European Journal of Criminology on the attitudes of prison guards in their country. They drew specifically and almost exclusively on Jim's 1980 study of prisoners' rights to underpin their analysis. Jim's work enabled them to make sense of the ambiguity they found in the guards' attitudes to the introduction of Western European-style legally guaranteed prisoners' rights into Romanian prisons deep in Central Europe. Now finally, what does this tell us about Jim the scholar? It tells us that he not only understands the rights talk of, scho of legal scholars, but that he's also a great observer of the ironies that arise from time to time when fine sentiments are applied in practice. Many around the world have noticed this fierce honesty and profited from his insights. We honor him for it. Jim, thank you very much. So, um, Dirk's going to be followed in a moment by Jeremy Travis and Elena and Frank Zimmer. We're going to have a five minute intermission between this part of the discussion and when they'll begin. Thanks. Thank you very much, David. This is a, a true test of the uh, power of informal social control. Is this going to work to get everybody to their seat? We'll see. So, I'm uh, delighted to be here uh, this evening to celebrate uh, Jim and his work and our friendship. Uh, I have two messages before I get started. One is to Ron Goldstock. Ron, you apologize. It was so generous of you to apologize for that misfortune of somehow my red wine glass appearing all over my shirt. But I want you to know that with the passage of time and a little bit of water, your sins have been erased. So uh, uh, the other message is for David Garland. So David did send all of us a, a note uh, that this is about sort of Jim's scholarly contribution, not a time for personal reflections. I'm disregarding that, <laughs> that request entirely, and I'll tell you why, because of the rather remarkable role that Jim uh, has played in my life. So I just have to take this moment. I wrote about it in the, in the members, but just to say it from the lectern, uh, there was a time in my life, I was a graduate of this law school, went on to uh, clerk for the then unknown Ruth Bader Ginsburg uh, on the Court of Appeals. Now I get to talk about uh, RBG. Uh, and was frankly wondering what I was going to do with my life and my legal education and sitting there saying, oh God, do I really have to practice law in order to make a living? And I got this call from Dennis Smith, uh, another good friend and colleague, saying that there was this new center being created at uh, NYU uh, by this guy named Jacobs. And would I come and interview for the job of the Martin and Marshall Fellow to help uh, Jim uh, get things started. That was 35 years ago. End of story, I came and interviewed, uh, Jim said, come join me. So I did a little math in the taxi down here. So that's 35 years. Uh, the Hoffinger, uh, Fortune of Hoffinger Colloquium was created. Every semester there were three lectures, I think. Do the math. It was not the same people coming to each one. There's not the, so who remembers, the, who's been to one of the, the dinners before one of the lectures? 
So you remember that moment when Jim stood up and introduced everybody around the table, no notes, and he got applause like this at the end of every round of, so David, this is your job now, to take, the, take this group, see if you can do it. You, in, you invited us just like Jim invited us, you know everybody who's here, yeah, okay, this, that's the end of the evening. So, uh, but just do, so the point I wanna make is that Jim, through the, this, the creation of this presence at this law school, created a community of scholars, expert, experts, people thinking about criminal justice, unparalleled in this city over this period of time. And that's a real tribute to Jim, his personality, and his interest in, in discussions and topics. So I was one of those. I got to be here at the beginning, but I've come back a number of times, gave two of those lectures, one here, one uh, across the street. And uh, it's, a, it's just a great tribute uh, to you, uh, my friend. So I have another thank you other than saving me from law practice and coming back here and, and setting me off in a different course. And that is that year that I came back to uh, NYU uh, was uh, the year when I met this young writing instructor uh, named Susan Herman. <laughs> Jan knows what happened then. They came to our wedding, two kids later. So much of my happiness I have to thank uh, uh, you for. So enough of the personal stuff said so David Garland get on to his book, right? Uh, but I just have to say this, it's, uh, it, you have changed my life. And so thank you, Jim. Very true. So, uh, so when, I, when I was here with Jim, I had that experience that I'm sure some of you have had in different forms. Uh, Paula talked about it as the instruction you should have no unpublished thoughts. <laughs> How many of you, just show of hands, have had the experience with Jim when he says, that's an article? So my first published article came because everyone's, we were doing a draft registration, said that's an article. So to the extent that I've contributed to the scholarly literature, even though not one of you really, it's because of that encouragement uh, that started uh, here. So I want to uh, talk about uh, Jim's book um, on criminal records, and it's sort of interesting that this is coming at this time in my life. I'm now off at Arnold Ventures and uh, running a foundation and investing in research and, and, and criminal justice reform around the country. And this topic of criminal records is front and center in the criminal justice reform discussion. So if you follow it at all, it is amazing how this has come from almost nowhere to being front and center. So I was thinking in preparing for tonight uh, how interesting it is that Jim was able to anticipate and then shape that wave of reform in ways that uh, are quite remarkable. So this book, it's a rel relatively recent book, is not one of the ones where Jim said 40 years ago, thank you, Mike Jacobson, uh, when you were you know, studying uh, to be a, a sociologist, he started a field. Jim took something, and it was the first book in this field on this topic that's been published. So just it, it really interesting, as Michael said, for, to, to reflect on this at this point in our professional careers. In classic Jim Jacobs fashion, this book came about because he was doing research on another topic. And that scholarly curiosity and sort of gonna go where my curiosity leads led to this book. And what was the other topic? It was the Brady Bill. Uh, so I was in, in the Clinton administration at the time. Brady Bill was very controversial. To get it through, there had to be a commitment to fund the upgrade of the national criminal history systems so that the instant background check could actually work. Right? A mass an untold story about gun control, which is it led to this, this in essence, uh, political compromise to invest in those systems so that the national background check could work. So Jim says, hmm, that's interesting. What's that all about? That led to a book. So the deeper that Jim explored this topic of criminal records, what he came to realize, and that we realize now, I think more than ever before, thanks to him, is the centrality of this phenomenon in our, to our country. So I'm gonna use some of his language from his book to critique that reality. And the language we use now is he glimpsed the contours of the era of punitive excess that we now live in. And he saw that the widespread use of criminal records reflected a larger reality of what other scholars have called the carceral state. It's sort of this, this embodiment of the role of the state in regulating a behavior of people who've been involved in criminal justice. So in classic Jim Jacobs style, he coined a phrase that captured the state of affairs. 
He wrote that what we call mass incarceration is the deep end of a much larger pool. And he was there describing that much larger pool, even though many of us have been focused on incarceration and sentencing policy. So this pool that uh, Jim described now swallows up a third of the American public that had criminal convictions. The FBI now reports that 72 million people, or one in three adults, a third of our public, have a criminal record reported to the national database. And that's a remarkable statistic, a central social fact. And many of these are, as Jim documented, for arrests that did not result in conviction. So there's a record that you were arrested, but no result, no record of the resulting uh, charge or, or, or outcome. So this was the first significant scholarly topic on this uh, theme. So it's not merely a descriptive piece, although that's important. He, really, he talked about the importance of criminal records as a marker of public identity going way beyond a traditional sort of systems view of the world. He explained that these records span a vast ecosystem of uh, public institutions, private entities, databases. Just imagine this world of uh, police creating a record for every arrest they make, those records going into court records and then into sex offender registries, gang databases. Every state maintains a criminal records repository. And there's this massive bureaucracy and structure that has been created out of the impulse just to know what happened to individual cases. But I think Jim tells us this impulse is much deeper. So this complexity is now made even more complex by the availability of these records through modern technology and the privatization, not necessarily intentional, but the private access to these records so that people now sell access to criminal records to those who want them. On top of this, as Jim documented in the book, these records are disturbingly inaccurate and remain inaccurate, notwithstanding that federal investment. As many as 50% of rap sheets do not show the ultimate disposition of an arrest, which gives, when you think about it, an exaggerated sense of criminality because we don't record the, that outcome. And what makes these inaccuracies and the reach and the privatization of these records, as Jim documented, what makes it more dangerous is that these records are increasingly being accessed by employers and non-criminal justice actors who may not know how to interpret the records, may not care about the inaccuracies or the inadequacies of those uh, databases, but use them to exclude people from what they might otherwise be entitled to. So it's a pretty dark world that uh, Jim has described. Cyril had this wonderful phrase as, uh, Jim is an academic lighthouse. That's why I was thinking about that, sitting here. Lighthouse doesn't tell you that there are no dangers. The lighthouse says, be aware of dangers, but the dangers are still there. So this is a good example of Jim as the academic lighthouse. So these records also attach to a vast network of collateral consequences. There are 44,000 legislative limitations on liberty and autonomy uh, called collateral consequences. And these create barriers to jobs and uh, housing and public benefits and, and so on. I, in some of my writing, use the phrase of invisible punishment. This is a form of invisible punishment that's very hard to get our minds and hands around. And it really means that one's debt to society is never paid, no matter the sentence. So in the eternal criminal record, Jim's book, uh, he emphasizes that the United States is exceptional. And thankfully, we have Elena here who's going to paint a different picture of how another Western country uh, takes on these issues and how Europe is in a very different place from where we are. But Jim reminds us that, that this reality is also balanced against another uh, countervailing American tradition, the tradition of uh, transparency, the tradition of everybody is entitled to know, uh, public access. And that indeed is one hallmark of our democracy and deeply embedded in our legal culture. So, but Jim is not just pessimistic, thankfully. Uh, about the state of affairs. And on the contrary, he challenges, uh, challenges us not to accept this records policy as inevitable, but instead to ask ourselves, that's what I hope we do tonight, to question how and why these records should be allowed to be used and accessed. He recognizes, and uh, I'm grateful for this because I think it's important to say that there are, are legitimate uses of criminal history records and criminal convictions, and particularly for law enforcement reasons, and maybe to limit people from access to certain jobs. So it's not a clear slam dunk that there should be no records. The question is what records should be maintained and for what purposes. 
But his hope was that this writing, his writing, his, this first landmark book would stimulate a whole field of research on this important topic. And indeed, much has changed in the four, four short years since this book was published. So I just want to report back to you, Professor Jacobs, how the world has changed since you took a look at it. Almost every state in the last several years has taken steps legislatively to chip away at the negative effects of criminal records and the limits on one's ability to earn a living, et cetera. Interestingly, in some states, those reform initiatives are championed by the business community. Think about it. In an era of a full, nearly full employment economy, you want to be able to get access to uh, that labor market. Uh, so they are sometimes the champions, an interesting finding. And we are also willing, able rather, to note that there's also a seismic shift, I would say, in public opinion on this point. And uh, Jim work, Jim's work no doubt played a role. Jim cites in his book a 1992 survey that found that 42% 40 of employers said they would be unlikely to hire a person with a criminal record. So that's a pretty strong indication that this is an actual bar. Last year, 2018, 80% of employers surveyed said they would valued workers with criminal records, and sometimes more than their workers without them. So there's something going on in the country that's important, and we have to take note of that. I also want to point out uh, to Jim that there's a, and this is what my colleagues and I are very much uh, in touch with, is as part of the larger, we could talk about the criminal justice reform era we live in, there's a big part of that now that is about expungement of records, certainly clearing of old records where possible, and it comes under a name, everything has a name these days, the Clean Slate Initiative. And the Clean Slate Initiative is not merely rhetorical, it's a legislative political project to get legislatures to, uh, to uh, enact changes. So here's the good news for you, Jim, I hope you can take this as good news. In Pennsylvania and Utah, just recently, last few months, uh, enacted reforms uh, to uh, limit the access to uh, and uh, speed up the expungement of these records. And in Pennsylvania, that reform uh, also includes a mechanism to hold private background check companies accountable for accurate data. A big change, because that means they can't use the data that they now have. And you recommended that in your book, and here we have it. So it's a interesting state of affairs in a relatively short time uh, that Jim has pointed the way toward, always being that academic uh, lighthouse. So I think today, as we stand here and we look at this book and its contribution and our current era, and we recognize that almost every institution of the criminal justice system is being challenged at its core, uh, from the movement for black lives uh, to uh, the progressive prosecutors to the end of mass incarceration. We hear this rhetoric even on the campaign trail today. And at the core of that is really, are really deep questions about the relationship between the public and the state. And there's nothing more profound than knowing the state has your records, has them forever, and those records may inhibit your ability to be a full citizen. So we thank you for that. I thank you for what you've done for me and my family, and it's great to be here with you. Thank you. Um, so, good night. I was asked to provide some comments on the importance of Jim's work on criminal records for Europe. So, this is what I'm going to do now in my five minutes. Um, I think it's no exaggeration to say that European scholars really discovered criminal records thank you to Jim Jacobs. I mean, before Jim, criminal records had, had no attention whatsoever to um, European <coughs> scholars criminal records outside the criminal justice system. And so that you see that this is not an exaggeration, I'll try to provide three examples of why the work of Jim Jacobs was so important for Europe. So the first example has to do with how accessible criminal records are. And I was quite shocked when I found out how in the United States everybody could find out the criminal record, the employers, the boyfriends, babysitters, the general public, you know. And, you know, I think Jim was even more astonished when I told him, how is this possible? Criminal records are secret. They're not public. They're confidential. And he said, what? 
What are you talking about? Criminal records are not public? No, of course not. You know, it would be a disproportionate punishment. So, but what, uh, it took us quite a while, as I can see by your faces, to understand also each other. And this prompted a whole battery of questions by Jim saying, but um, in Spain, are the trials public? Are court records secret? Can journalists, I mean, all these questions that I had to struggle to answer him quickly in the following two years that we worked together on this issue. And we came a little bit to the conclusion to, to see two very different general principles. The American right to know and the European um, right to privacy and right to rehabilitation, right? So this was one example of how we um, managed this intellectual journey. Uh, the second example also has to do with, we had been working together already for a couple of months, uh, drafts back and forth, emails, and then all of a sudden I said, Jim, I'm not sure I know what a criminal record is. <laughs> you know, and again, this had to do with that for Jim and in the States, a criminal record I think is what you called a rap sheet, you know, something like I had to, you know, understand the initials, but it's like a record by the police. When the police arrest you, that's a criminal record. But in Europe, a criminal record is a conviction record. I mean, there's no criminal records outside the courts, you know, and no dismissals, no acquittals, sometimes not even misdemeanors. So again, we had to discuss why is this difference? And I think it had to do because in the States, criminal records are a tool of crime prevention. They're used like something to prevent crime. Whereas again, um, in Europe, criminal records are like a badge, a badge of dishonor. And if they're a badge of dishonor, it is logical that you require a court. I mean, there is no badge of dishonor without a court conviction with due process. Okay, my third and last um, example of how influential uh, Jim's thoughts were was on the expungement that right now Jeremy uh, spoke about. I kept telling Jim, don't you think expungement is a good idea to erase criminal records five years after or 10 years after as we do in Europe? And I remember he kept saying, yeah, yeah, of course, it's, expungement is necessary, but you still have to disclose the criminal record. So, what, what do you mean you still have to disclose the criminal record? I mean, if you expunge it, you don't say. Then he would ask me, but do you allow to rewrite the history? Is there a right to lie in Europe? <laughs> no. Well, I don't know if there's a right to lie. I mean, so again, it, um, as you see, it was a, a remarkable journey that <laughs> really that allowed us to see the different uh, jurisdictions and the different cultural values that were in those different systems. Um, so I wanted to finish how I began. Um, Jim discovered the topic, I mean, there's no doubt about this. But uh, his impact wouldn't be as big were it not also for Jim's personal characteristics. And I think that it's Jim's capacity to ask questions, a battery of questions, but also Jim's capacity to find the answers genuinely fascinating, as he says, fascinating, and you hear this and you think, this is important, right? And also his ability to provide self-esteem to all his friends and co-authors. Thank you, Jim. Ten minutes on gun control. <laughs> and second prize, <laughs> Jim Jacobs has been almost one of a kind in his serious and skeptical scholarship on firearms control law and policy in the United States. And unlike the story with criminal records, you can't do comparative work in other developed countries on firearms and violence and control structures. The United States can only be compared with itself. Now, 
Why do I say Jacobs is almost one of a kind? Well, first off, very few legal academics have done any serious work on guns, violence, and gun control. Serious gun law professors are a rare breed to begin with, and most of them favor tight firearms regulation. So already, Jacobs is in a minority but he gets to be in an even more rarefied minority because most of the very few gun control critics that you find in legal academia are gun enthusiasts. They got there because they love guns. <laughs> A personal note here. Jim Jacobs isn't a gun nut. Well, what is he then? <laughs> what, what he is is an American law scholar who is a gun control skeptic on principle. And he's one of only two I have known in the excuse me half a century that I've been in this business. And both of them turn out to be very close friends of mine. The first was John Kaplan of Stanford University Law School. The second is James Jacobs of NYU. And both are serious students of the costs and limits of attempts to prohibit victimless crimes generally. They've studied not only guns, but drugs and other contexts of demand uh, 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 oriented behavior and the criminal regulation thereof. And they're skeptical about the costs and they're skeptical about the benefits. Now it turns out that gun control legislation in the United States is a very two-sided controversy in a very peculiar fashion. Each side has an enormously strong argument. Supporters of firearms restriction have a very strong argument that guns increase the lethality of violent assaults. That's the strong pro-control issue. Of course they contribute to the costs of crime in human lives in the thousands. Now, but I said it's a two-sided issue. What are the prospects that less than drastic legal control efforts can save lots of those American lives? That's the issue that favors the skeptics. Jim Jacobs has so far contributed two major books to firearms control scholarship, and each one came at a critical aftermath of moral panic in the United States on guns and violence. Can Gun Control Work was published in 2002 and was a skeptical tour to horizon of the entire scope of problem-defining and problem-solving attempts in gun regulation. It was a particular value. I told you it was published in 2002. School shootings in the United States that culminated in Columbine uh, peaked concern and panic in the United States in 1999 and 2000. So it was a period of time when the pressure to do something, no matter what that something was, in the heading was quite strong. Okay. But if Columbine was the provocation for a gun panic about 
firearms and violence in 1999 and the turn of the 21st century, the Sandy Hook slaughter for six-year-olds produced a moral panic that was even greater uh, and is still really with us in 2019. And when federal legislative action proved difficult, blue states, liberal states, like New York, attempted to find new state laws that could quench the public thirst for legislative action. The need was to do something and the places where legislative majorities were available to do something were the states that had high urban populations and liberal public concern. But now we encounter an interesting problem and irony. The states like New York and New Jersey and Connecticut that had the strong support to do something at the state level were also states that had already done a lot in the control of guns. The irony was that the states with the greatest need for symbolic statements after Sandy Hook and after Columbine also had the fewest important gaps in their existing firearms legislation. So they had to do something, and they had to make that something look like a lot, but there wasn't a lot that really needed to be done. This is when you get details and miscellany in legislative agendas. And that produced in two waves, first of all, the SAFE Act as New York gun legislation, and Jim Jacobs' book, which is a masterful study of the operational problematics of symbolic legislation in the gun law area. The book is called The Toughest Gun Law in the Nation. It will soon be available for reading. I think it is something a lot of people could learn from. What the book teaches and illustrates is of substantial value to scholars of the impracticality and symbolic excesses of penal law. That much is easy, and that's a natural audience. Most of us in legal scholarship spend most of our time reading the books that are produced by the people we agree with. <laughs> but I think that the toughest gun law in the nation by James Jacobs is also an important lesson for any serious advocates of firearms control to save lives and balance freedom in American life. This is the kind of careful and detailed scholarship of the law in action that can inspire more intelligent action the next time tragedy strikes, it will always strike in America, no matter what our legislation. And it is a monument of informed policy analysis that should be read widely by the people who make decisions about public policy and who care deeply about those issues. So it turns out, skeptic that he is, old grump, <laughs> Jim Jacobs is also, in doing this work, 
a valuable friend to rational firearms control in American life. Thank him. Entering into the final part of our program, uh, as promised, we could only scratch the surface, uh, but I think we did a very good job scratching what we could. Uh, I, I think it's un, un, unambiguous that his scholarly impact is clear, and I think you also have, through the presentations and in the book before you, strong evidence of his human impact as well, a testament to how many people he has touched that's evident in this room. Uh, not only from all of you who made times in your busy schedules, but those who traveled from literally around the world uh, and, and didn't even take the stand just to sit here and celebrate this man and his extraordinary work and extraordinary character. Uh, the metaphor was given of a lighthouse, but I think of Jim as almost a tractor beam, uh, a light that doesn't just shine but pulls you in with its warmth. It affirms your sense of worth, and somehow when you leave his company, you not only feel like you belong where you were, but that you were more interesting and intelligent and full of great ideas than you had ever thought you were before. Uh, so in our closing remarks, I have two introductions to make. The first is John Sexton, who, as I'm sure you all know, is the former president of this university and before that, the dean of this law school. What you may not know is that he and Jim arrived at NYU together uh, in 1981 and had neighboring offices. And so not only has he been a leader of this institution, but has known Jim since he became a member of it. And then last, uh, on behalf of Jim's family, is his daughter Sophie. Uh, uh, who is, uh, most importantly to Jim, I think, along with her husband, Jonathan, the parents of Rowan and Aurora, who I'm sure you've all heard about, uh, his beautiful granddaughters, who he much loves, and who was also for 10 years an assistant district attorney here in Manhattan before moving to San Francisco to work for a little startup called Apple. Uh, so I will turn it over now to John. So first of all, uh, to Aaron and to Rachel and to David, uh, I, I don't think you could have conceptualized a greater celebration of one of the great people to walk this earth uh, than you did this evening. This uh, convening in this place where he convened so much over such a period of time and to do it in the manner that you have where we, we took time to focus seriously on, albeit only a small part, but, but an important part of, an important part, but not the only part of Jim's life, which is his work and his work with others. So congratulations to you. I, 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 wanna, I wanna do my bit here by, by just giving you a couple of images. Uh, as Aaron said, uh, in 1981, a cohort of faculty arrived here uh, in alphabetical order. There were three Hall of Famers, uh, Anthony Amsterdam, Ronald Dworkin, and James Jacobs. And, and uh, they, they all graced my lives in, in, in different ways, uh, Tony and Ronnie. Both became dear friends. But because we were up in the attic, before it was remodeled into something that uh, is at least uh, modestly respectful, uh, it was really an attic back then. Uh, and uh, it was the attic in which J Jeremy met Susan, so uh, good things happened up there. Uh, and it was the, the hall that uh, Jed 
played uh, kickball with me, often with Jeremy and Jim as part of the teams. Uh, it was a great attic, but it was a great attic principally because it was lit by Jim. And uh, what happened there, as close as I was to, to Tony and to Ronnie, was that I, as the free rider in the group, uh, got what we call in Brooklyn, now this is in Chinese, <laughs> and, and I'll get to the mob talk in a moment, but what we call in Brooklyn, a brother by another mother. <laughs> and, and I got a brother by another mother. And we did, even back in those days, we began to use, this is uh, mob talk, and this was before you began writing about mob because we used to refer to each other as gumbari, <laughs> gumbari, so which is another way of saying brother by another mother. <laughs> Starting in those days, and now almost 40 years, it's not quite 40 years, but by the time we have a new president, by the time we have a new president, I'm sorry, I'm looping on that. <laughs> By the time we have a new president, it'll be 40 years. Uh, I have this image of Jim, and uh, I was sitting here tonight listening, you know, as what would be the appropriate image. I have a closing image to give you as I'll finish my fiercely enforced five minutes. But... Uh, those of you that used to watch David Letterman may actually have seen this, because this is actually a David Letterman skit. So there's the great Houdini trip, where, where, where Houdini has himself lowered into a, a, a chamber that's a glass chamber filled with water, and you can see Houdini in there, and it's all, and it chains, and, and he escapes, right? So Letterman did a takeoff on that skit, and, uh, and the Tonight Show one night, he had, I think it was, they said, by number, because it was reported in the paper the next day, a thousand Alka-Seltzer tablets attached to himself. <laughs> and they lowered him into the vat of water with the thousand, now that's Jim Jacobs, okay? <laughs> the, 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 the resulting chemistry is a, a, a little bit of the effervescence and, and the energy uh, that is Jim. And I think it's, in, uh, the, when I think of Jim, I, I, I think, and I, I would venture to say this will ring true with you. This is not Sextonian overstatement, okay? Uh, my son says that usually, if you're listening to dad, you have to understand he experiences the world as 15% better than it is. And then he articulates that experience as 10% better than that. This is not true when I speak of James Jacobs. Okay, this is, I, I venture to say that if I, if I did a kind of Jeremy-like raising of the hands, and I'm not going to do it because I know the answer would be unanimously with me on this. I don't think I've ever had any encounter with Jim where I haven't felt elevated. I've, I, I don't think I've had a conversation with him uh, that I didn't enjoy, even on extremely unpleasant topics, even when I, I was crying help to him as my gumbari. Uh, I don't think he's ever entered a room that he hasn't made better by his presence in it. This, his capacity, and it started in the 80s in this building, and, and it is not an exaggeration to say that even when we moved offices off the attic, and uh, that I don't think a day went by, that because we were around this building all the time together, and I don't think a day went by that we didn't have a conversation that wasn't a dream for this law school, and what we thought it could be and what we hoped it would be and what we were willing to sacrifice to make it. And uh, to the extent that, uh, that we've done things in this law school of which we should be very proud over those last 40 years, I would say that, uh, that Jim was the father of many of those ideas, but more importantly, he was, he was the father 
of the faith in this place and what it could be. He was never without hope. Never without hope. One of my favorite poems is, 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 is starts off by let those who stop at mere success and do not press on to glorious failure be condemned as the spiritual middle class. <laughs> James Jacobs is in the spiritual 1%. <laughs> this guy is not in the middle class. He never met anything that he didn't think was possible, whether it was a ski slope or, or something that he was dreaming for this law school. And those daily conversations led then, as we went through the 90s and the three decades thereafter, into conversations where he was my coach. And he had an uncanny, and still has an uncanny sense that I'm sure is part of the secret of his love affair with Jan. But in his friendship with me, he had an uncanny sense of knowing when it might be, because now we couldn't see each other every day, especially when I moved out of this building. But he knew when I needed a visit. And he knew when I needed someone to say to me, I will stand with you and I will take shots for you because this is a friend that stays with you in good times and in bad times and steps in front of you to take the slings and the shots. Now, all that's kind of the story of us as colleagues, but there's much more to being a Gumbadi than being a colleague and dreaming for an institution. Uh, in that regard, the word I'll just say in summary that I would use for Jim is he's a possibilitarian. <laughs> he just thinks that things are possible that other people don't think are possible. But boy, the most extraordinary achievement uh, in his life where he's, he's really a, a, a role model for me is in his love affair with Jan and his love for his family, and Sophie, and Tom, and now the families that they're producing. There's, there's no real image that I can give you of that, except one huge, larger than imaginable, almost daunting to think of even for a possibilitarian heart that's filled with love. I love you, Gumbadi. You've made my life better. On behalf of everyone here and everyone within galaxies of here, God bless you and thank you. You've made all of our lives better. try to pull up some notes, but I start by saying that to talk at an event like this <clears throat> is, is almost impossible. Um, and uh, it's impossible almost for, for many, many reasons. Of course, uh, first and foremost, um, it's just very difficult to follow and daunting uh, to follow such a distinguished uh, set of speakers, um, some of whom I, I uh, sat in class with, uh, but all of whom I am uh, eternally intimidated by. Um, and yes, I, I, as mentioned, I had a career as a litigator, so I should be able to get through this. Uh, but I left that three years ago, and in Silicon Valley, I now only speak in emojis um, and catchphrases about syncing and bandwidth. Uh, 
So this is going to be difficult. Uh, to add to add to that, um, I was I was told in, in in arriving here that I would be following John Sexton, and that's when I just completely gave up. It's it's difficult to close out this event um, and impossible in a way to give this speech because it's really impossible for me to put into words uh, the closeness that. I have with my father um, the extent to which he is the core um, of who I am, uh, of my work ethic, of my uh, sense of loyalty, my sense of fairness, my sense of humor. And Many of you know that that's, um, of course, not just one-sided, uh, but that my father is also a pioneer in, in perhaps uh, practicing attachment parenting with middle-aged children. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's very difficult to sum up the level of integration that I have with my dad. We speak every day, we speak about everything, and there are no words that I could give um, that could summarize that um, or summarize how meaningful it is to me and my family to see all of you here um, and to feel all of the love that is in this room tonight. My father, in being an attachment parent, um, had so much attachment that he was able to also develop so many surrogate children um, for whom he could <laughs> provide attachment as well, um, that I want to recognize um, those folks, um, not just within the family, um, my first cousins uh, sitting over here uh, for whom my father um, is also in a parental role, uh, but also um, my father's many co-authors, his many students, um, the children of faculty at NYU as well. And I just ask you, and my friends, um, my friends too, so I just ask you um, that if you uh, are a surrogate child of my father, to raise your hand so that we can recognize that role and that achievement that he's played in his life as well. <laughs> So as you know, my father, um, he has relentless concern uh, for his uh, surrogate children. As, as, Rachel, as Rachel mentioned, you know, he, he's not only concerned about uh, how your career is going, how your relationships are going, um, but also just generally how your human capital is doing, whether you're, co you're taking advantage of the city enough. Um, <laughs> My best friend Kelly was reminding me of a, of a time period where my father walked in on us um, playing Mario Kart and physically stood in front of the TV <laughs> until we got up uh, because he, that was a waste of time. Um, So he's an amazing guy but, and, and also a relentless editor, which is... Um, which as his co-authors know, and again, his students and colleagues, um, if you show him a piece of writing, you are guaranteed to get a very brutal red line in return. So that also makes this speech very difficult. Um, when my, my father asked me to say a few words on behalf of the family, um, I told him, okay, well, I would, I'll thank the organizers of this event, Aaron and um, Rachel and David, uh, and I'll just keep it brief. And he said, absolutely not. <laughs> That's not acceptable. And I'd like to get a draft of your remarks beforehand. <laughs> so that was tough, too. <laughs> and as we sat down uh, to draft the remarks, he, <laughs> he wasn't really happy with any of <laughs> my thoughts. <laughs> and he was typing away. And ultimately, I said, Dad, do you, you just want to email me 
your thoughts, and I'll, I'll just read those. And he said, absolutely, that's what I mean. So that takes off a little bit of the pressure. And so I'm just going to conclude um, with what my father wants to say to all of you, um, which is this. Today, I feel like the luckiest man in the world, surrounded by family, friends, and colleagues. I want to thank the organizers of this wonderful event, David, Aaron, and Rachel, and thanks, too, to the many speakers. I want to say a special thanks to my deans, to John Sexton, to Ricky Revez, and to Trevor Morrison for all of their support over these many years. And of course, I owe a debt of gratitude to my NYU colleagues for sustaining the most supportive and stimulating intellectual environment. I want to thank my co-authors, many of whom are here tonight, and from whom I have learned so much and couldn't have achieved what I have without you. And lastly, my biggest thanks to my soulmate, Jan Sweeney, for putting up with, my, with me and for weaning me from my workaholism. <laughs> Dad, we want to thank you for making time in what is always your very busy schedule to allow us to honor you. You are the North Star for everybody in this room. Thank you.